Uh, my name is Michael Young. This is the first of three television installments about the changing nature of architectural mediation in relationship to technology. This first one is going to be about geometry and drawing constraints. The next one I think we're going to do in a month or so, which is about a relationship with painting, and the last one is a relationship to collage and reproduction. So today, we're going to be looking at a, a brief history of 2,300 years of drawing constraints. And the point being that our drawings have always been constrained, and they've been constrained for uh, specific pragmatic reasons, but those pragmatic reasons end up redistributing sensible information that changes our concepts and our aesthetics and what we do. And to start this off, I've got two things here. I've got a compass or a divider. It's always good when a treaty starts and an architect has that in his hand because it means he's an architect. And a straight edge. This one's a heavy one. Probably could do some damage if I didn't wield it uh, properly. But these two things are regulatory devices. They constrain information. So if I have a straight edge, I can constrain a line, and I can translate a point along a straight line. I've just basically regulated a translation, a translation of one point along a linear trajectory. Uh, this controls and regulates rotation, a divider or a compass. The deal is, though, if I can put these two things together, if I can put the compass with my straight line, and make just a couple marks. And now put these two things in a relationship, that if I connect those two points, I've bisected that line. I've also produced perpendicularity. So the combination of a straight edge and a compass in Euclid's first book on geometry has given me the uh, idea of perpendicularity, the idea of bisection of angle, and the idea of bisection of line. That may not seem like such a big deal, but I can do this again and again and again. And basically what I'm producing when I bisect lines is a constrained relationship of ratios. The other way to say that is I'm now able to speak about the unit of a whole in relationship to a half, in relationship to a fourth, an eighth, a sixteenth, a thirty-second. Um, I produce rationalization. So I can now speak about wholes in terms of parts, and I can break them down, I can measure them. So again, the combination of two constraint systems, rotation and translation, gives me the concepts of perpendicularity, concepts of parallelism, the concepts of ratio, the concepts of rationalism. So I'm now a rational human being because I have constrained my lines via uh, subdivision. Drawing one. This is a metric geometry. We're going to do five drawings. There we go, metric. Um, five drawings are going to be basically tied to Felix Klein's Erlingen program where geometries are differentiated via their allowable transformations and the properties that they hold invariant. So metric geometry allows rotation and translation, holds length and angle invariant. I can use that to measure things. But with another kind of geometric system, let's say I got a triangle here. And by the way, this triangle is just produced by that. So that now gives me this. A triangle initially was a set square. Was this was set, that was set, this was a chord between them. It actually didn't have anything to do with triangularity. It was just about holding the 90 degree constraint system. But if I use that now, and what I'm going to constrain with this system of geometry is similarity. And that angle running down the middle that hypotenuse or that chord of the triangle is the line that regulates proportion. So everything that I hit into that, from any given side, I subdivide that. I've created a proportionally smaller rectangle. Proportion is ratio of ratios. A is to B is C is to D, so that I can begin to work at the small and affect the large. 
If I'm going to make little drawings and have them affect big buildings, I need to have a concept of constraint like similarity. Length is no longer invariant. Length is now variable, but I can make decisions about the small, and the small affects the large. This line is the regulating trace that Le Corbusier would use to structure the facades, of, such as the Villa Stein and Garsh, and um, has its history all through the Renaissance in terms of how one begins to constrain relationships via proportion. And we'll call this similar. That's our geometric system number two. The next drawing that we're going to look at is a projective constraint. And we'll do it like this. So if I have that line, this here, this here, this there, and then I bring that down to that, there, this to here, and then come up on the other side to there. Um, this is going to go back to that. And this is going to come into this. So. This is Desargues' theorem. This is a 17th century geometer, French geometer, who is one of the founders of projective geometry. And projective geometry is a system of associated relationships of collinearity and um, coincidence. And that is what begins to structure a projective system. So from this drawing here, if that point, let's say we call that an eyeball, then this triangle that's situated right here in this constrained relationship, and this triangle right here are in a projected relationship with each other. Another way to say this is that if I stuck my eye at that point, that triangle and that triangle would look identical. They, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart in any way, shape, or form. This is one of the root questions of perspective. It's one of the root questions of the way in which we draw a reality that's outside of us onto the plane. It allows us to propose both one reality transferred into another via planar section and also allows us to reproject this out into the world. The interesting thing about Desargues' theorem as well is that uh, it actually works for any of these points that you choose. You could choose that to be your eye and then this triangle right here is projectively related to this triangle right here. And their edges all meet about this fold line, that fold line being a line that folds one plane into another. And so the minute you think about that, that's great, but I don't have ten eyes. And there are ten points here, all of them in a projective relationship. So it's a strange constraint, but it's a constraint that we all carry around with us no matter what. We actually are constantly carrying around a projective relationship between our eyeballs and the world, even though the lenses may be slightly curved. The idea that you could have a projective geometry and deal with changes in length, changes in angle, changes in um, parallelism. Uh, if you send these points out to infinity, you get a fine geometry, you get parallel relationships. So this is the general condition for every single relationship in the world that is projective. And it is associative. The associativeness of it is what's going to become important as one moves into a parametric system of our software. Every single thing that I move here would update and adjust every single thing else. It also works in three dimensions. So this is a little Desargian apparatus. And you can kind of see it basically in relationship to the drawing that I've just done. You can imagine that these are that triangle, that triangle projecting into that triangle from that point. And this also works in three dimensions. So as I move up, a little bit like a marionette, I like to think of it. That triangle projects into that other triangle, and no matter where, I happen to move it, now they're the same triangle, now they're a point, 
I begin to have the constrained system of associated relationships of collinearity and coincidence that we all bring with us everywhere we go as we have eyeballs projecting lines of sight between vision and the world. Okay, so we have one more drawing that we want to do. The last drawing that we're going to work on is uh, the way in which a nerve's curve is defined. Nerves just basically means non-uniform rationalized basis lines, which are the differential geometry that is measured constraining our curves that we draw in a program such as Rhino. And this is the fundamental operation for all lines that we build in a digital model today. The constraint is built out of associated relationships of variable uh, vectors tangent to the curve. What you draw is a control polygon. So if you drew four points, what you've actually said is that first point sets the initial vector of what the tangent is going to be at the start. Those last two points set that end vector of where the tangent is going to be at the end. And the middle two points frame out that control polygon. From then, it's a subdivision of that polygon in order to frame, in order to create the curve. So if I divided each of these in half, and I divided that in half, that's a tangent on the curve. The midpoint is on the curve. If I do it in quarters, and then I do this in quarters, that is a tangent on the curve, and the quarter mark on that is on the curve, a point on the curve. If I did it in three fourths, and then I divide that in the three fourths, and I divide the third quarter of that, that's a tangent on the curve, and these points and their tangencies are what builds up the nerve's curve in any software that you're building a digital model that's controlling curvature. That's a degree three curve. And another way to say it is that all of these softwares treat lines as curves. And when you draw a curve, you're actually basically manipulating vectors and directions of vectors and the associations between how they move, the rates of change, the first differential. So we'll call this. Hopper, which is just an interface for controlling the parameters of this definition. And see here, this is the curve. These are the subdivisions. Degree 1, degree 2, degree 3. That little dot is on the curve, and that's its tangent. And by controlling the slider, you basically begin to build up the relationships that are the nerves curve, the variable rates of change of vectors constraining that curve in space. Now, why does this all matter? Oh, do that. Why does this all matter? Why am I talking about it? this? What, what the hell does this help us to do in terms of our relationship to architecture, to design, to computation? Um, Part of this point is that there's a pragmatic level at which all of these constrained systems are the measurement that allows these designs to translate to the real world through their uh, measurements. It just so happens that the measurements are now happening automatically within the, the computation of each curve that you draw. You don't see it. And prior to that, you maybe were more aware of it in terms of a straight edge or a scale or uh, a proportional device such as that. But the other thing is to have an awareness of the systems that we're working with. 
we tend to actually conceptually and aesthetically trust the systems that we are able to manipulate. And there's something that people still hold when they look at a uh, curve in Rhino, and they grab a control point, and they pull that control point, and things happen somewhere else. And they wonder to themselves, why did that just happen? Who's controlling this? We have a little bit of a, a, a weird relationship to action at a distance, where we begin to distrust it. If we can't actually see and control the notations that are operating in our environments, but that does not mean that they are not controlled. It does not mean that you do not have control over them. We just need to begin to gain uh, an understanding to, in a relationship with the constraint systems that you're working with. And after that, hopefully you become aware of the possibilities for redistributing sensible information and other avenues of aesthetic exploration are open to you. This is a three-dimensional nerves curve. Of course, it works in three dimensions as well. And uh, each of these tangents are on that curve, each of those points are on that curve, and that's basically building up the way in which that curve would move in space. And that's basically all I've got. So, thank you very much.